Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, great to be here. Um, this is the first lecture of the calendar year for the Extreme Reliefs uh, project. Um, yeah, I invite everyone to go see the website. It's, I think, www.extremebeliefs.com, right? Um, so if you're you know, interested in our events um, or what we're working on, um, you can see our papers, um, some uh, public facing work, uh, as well as lectures, um, and find out more about the team. And uh, yeah, today it's our great pleasure um, to uh, have, uh, hope I get this right, so Associate Professor here at the FU, uh, Jan Willem Freuden? Freuden, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, he's also a senior researcher at the Institute uh, for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement uh, here in the Netherlands and an endowed professor of uh, radicalization, extremism, and conspiracy thinking at Maastricht. And uh, he has an impressive, uh, uh, yeah, just you're really a prolific uh, researcher uh, on conspiracy theories. So, um, there's a recent book you have from 2018, I believe, called The Psychology of Conspiracy Theories. Um, and also a book, uh, I think, what is it called? The uh, Moral uh, Punishment Inst Instinct, is that right? And I think also um, one on polarization, if I'm not mistaken. So anyway, just a really prolific scholar, uh, ties right into what we're interested in here with the Extreme Beliefs Project. So we're happy to hear what you have to say today about belief in conspiracy theories during the pandemic. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, introduction and thank you all for being here. I uh, have to say I'm really excited to actually give a talk in person again. Uh, because, uh, uh, well, been a while, well, and, uh, so I'll uh, do my best. And well, the last two years have been impactful for, for, uh, for everyone. It's been, uh, well, a challenging time, but also if you study conspiracy theories, it has also been quite an interesting time. Um, because, yeah, we've seen many conspiracy theories coming up uh, at the start of the pandemic and perpetuating uh, throughout uh, the events. And it also has inspired a lot of uh, research. And I also did some research uh, on it. And yeah, today I'll be sharing some of my findings um, with you. Now, a little uh, something on uh, COVID-19 conspiracy theories. I'm going to see if I can make my slides a little bit more visible. OK, now I disappear. So, OK. Okay, well, let's go. Um, early in the pandemic, there were a lot of conspiracy theories uh, suggesting that uh, COVID-19 had been created in the lab by human beings. Uh, you might not uh, have uh, expected that, but that's actually a very old and ancient idea. Uh, during the Spanish flu of uh, 1918, exactly the same conspiracy theory, well, a variant of exactly the same conspiracy theory was circling in the United States that the Germans had uh, created the Spanish flu in the lab and were now spreading it through uh, uh, Esprint, uh, Bayer, it's a German company, but that which already existed then. Um, there was also early in the pandemic, a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about 5G radiation. Uh, it's, uh, it wasn't an actual virus, but that we were getting ill because of this new telecommunication network. Well, you can't really see it because of uh, the Zoom uh, thing, but, but that's a picture of Bill Gates. Poor Bill Gates, he uh, donates uh, yeah, more to charity than the average Western European country, but he's also the, the lead evil actor in many conspiracy theories, for instance, alleging uh, that he uh, yeah, wants to do all these sorts of microchips in the corona vaccines in order to make us uh, all uh, remote controllable robots. So there's a lot of uh, COVID conspiracy theories. And then yeah, a natural question to ask is, you know, is this an, isn't this a bit of a fringe phenomenon? And, and this was also uh, when I started with my research on in conspiracy theories back in 2009. I think this was a common question that I got. Isn't this a bit, you know, nibbling around the edges what you're doing? But actually, no. Um, uh, many people uh, who uh, aren't patholo pathological or anything who are function perfectly well in their normal everyday life believe these sorts of conspiracy theories. So these were all nationally representative samples that took place in uh, 2020 uh, in various countries by various research agencies uh, when the pandemic started. So in the United States, they asked was COVID-19 plants, and in Canada and Australia, they asked whether it was purposely 
created in the lab and uh, in the United States, 25% of the sample believe that, in Canada, 26%, and Australia, even 39% of the sample, which begs the question, how big is this in the Netherlands? And the answer appears to be 15%. That's a sample in uh, May 2020. Uh, a funny anecdote, I was uh, right after those findings came in, in a radio show and in a radio program, and the uh, interviewer asked me whether or not I was shocked uh, that the figure was so high, and I, you know, I already had seen some international, uh, of the international figures, uh, there was also one in the, in the US in March, actually, so, uh, so my answer had to be, actually, no, I am uh, relieved that it is so low in the Netherlands. Um, normal people who function very well in their everyday life believe them. Also, people who are really successful uh, tend to believe them. Here are a couple of uh, well-known uh, celebrities, internationally and nationally. Eric Clapton, uh, well, I actually have played guitar myself for 15 years in a, in a band. Uh, well, not anymore, but I used to. And anyone who plays guitar is a fan of Eric Clapton because he's really good. So it was really a shock to me to find out that he's a complete anti-vaxxer. Of course, all the scientific research on COVID propaganda. And he actually wrote two songs uh, uh, articulating his aversion against the corona measures. Great music, actually, damn it. Um, anyway, uh, Woody Harrelson, well-known actor, of course, in the beginning of the pandemic, posted something on uh, in his social media on Instagram, clarifying that he thought the theory that COVID-19, that the pandemic was caused by 5G radiation, plausible. In the Netherlands, Viola Holt, former talk show host, doesn't want to go anywhere near vaccinated people because she's afraid to get infected with the vaccine. After all, that makes you magnetic, so she thinks. Uh, Lama Frans is a, is a Dutch rapper who has been uh, widespread in the news. Uh, he had his own uh, conspiracy uh, channel, actually, on YouTube, which got closed down at some point. Uh, at some point, there was a QAnon demonstration at, uh, in Amsterdam at the Museum Square where he protested along uh, against uh, pedophilia and blood drinking elites in uh, Dutch politics. Dr. Proust, formerly known as uh, the Dutch number one uh, top model and uh, now mostly known for her conspiratorial ideas. Uh, don't touch Dr. Proust, so I found out when she came uh, in the media with the conspiracy theories. I was asked by Telegraaf TV to comment on that and I kept it really I kept it really polite, actually. I said, I said something like, you know, she should be careful uh, with uh, what she says because she has been, inspires many people. And, she, you know, being a good model doesn't necessarily make you a good virologist. It was something like that, really. And I was uh, fishing uh, for two weeks the hate mail of male Dr. Cruz fans from my inbox. It was, uh, well, pretty amazing, actually, how, uh, how defensive some uh, of our male fans uh, suddenly got for that. Anyway, um, so... What I want to talk about is two questions. Conspiracy theories during the pandemic. Are they harmful or harmless? Uh, are, should we, uh, you know, uh, uh, allow people their own opinions? Should we uh, respect different points of view? Or can they do actual harm to actual people? That's uh, something, I think, a question uh, that's important to investigate. And then also, why do these conspiracy theories force during the pandemic? Now, for the second question, I will mostly rely on my research actually before that was carried out before the pandemic. Um, because there already were a lot of insights about why crisis situations in general uh, and, and feelings of anxiety and feelings of uncertainty um, uh, stimulate conspiracy thinking. So uh, for the second question, I'll rely mostly on my research prior to the pandemic, but also with a couple of studies uh, that took place during the pandemic. Well, are they harmful or harmless? Well, early in the pandemic, uh, in March 2020, this was, uh, there were a lot of these fires of uh, telecommunication masts um, in the news. There were more than 20 in Netherlands, there were also a lot of them in the United Kingdom. Um, well, the police has also um, yeah, clearly said, uh, uh, articulated the suspicion that this was due to activist groups who did this out of a belief that the 5G radiation um, yeah, was causing the pandemic, and this was yeah, uh, really harmful, particularly as, uh, you know, these telecommunication must regulate all mobile uh, uh, traffic. So in other words, if you burn one down, then uh, in the vicinity, it might for a, a while uh, be difficult or impossible to call uh, the alarm number, which is during a pandemic pretty harmful, of course. 
Um, we've also seen a lot of these anti-corona protests. A lot of these were inspired by, uh, yeah, uh, by, uh, yeah, by sentiments that uh, we're not told the truth, that the government is lying about uh, uh, why they really are taking these measures or why they really want everyone to get vaccinated. And there, uh, in 2021, there were, have been a lot of conspiracy theories about the corona vaccines, uh, such as that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that the side, possible side effects are being suppressed and so on. But then again, all of this is what it is. They're anecdotes, right? This, uh, this, is, this isn't scientific evidence or anything. This is just, uh, you know, uh, me reporting what has been wide, widespread all over the news. Um, in order to actually test whether uh, they're harmful, we need to uh, actually study it. So that's what we did. This is a study that uh, I did together with a, a whole bunch of colleagues from various universities. Together with the Dutch political research organization Kieskompas, uh, who uh, yeah is uh, well known for its uh, for you know um, these voting advice applications during elections, but they also they're also a research agency that coordinates huge uh, research panels. So we did a large three-wave study uh, through Kieskompas, and uh, yeah we weighted the data to get nationally representative estimates. And uh, the first wave took place very early in the pandemic, dur during the first lockdown to 2020, more than 9,000 participants uh, responded to our online questionnaire. Uh, the second wave was um, in June, which was after the first lockdown. In that time, you know, uh, it, was, it wasn't entirely you know, over yet. We still had to physically distance, but, but uh, you know, restaurants and bars were open. You could have a drink at the terrace. It was, all a bit more uh, easygoing, so to speak, at that point. And then the third wave, oh, so, yes, the third wave was in December 2020, and that was, of course, during the second lockdown when everything had closed up again. Now, then we uh, have a uh, various projects emerging from this data. I'm just gonna uh, present the two, uh, yeah, the two that are, that I'm most excited uh, about. This one has already been uh, published actually. So that was the question. So uh, to what extent do conspiracy beliefs early in the pandemic in April, 2020, predict a range of health and well-being outcomes eight months later? Now these health and well-being outcomes were measured dichotomously in a yes or no format. Did you or did you not do this? in the past eight months. And these were the results. So we asked, did you or did you not get tested for corona? And there you see, so, uh, so this is uh, the, the one for zero, that's, that's, there's no effect. There you see that uh, the more strongly believe, people believe in conspiracy theories in April, the less likely they were to have been tested uh, eight months later. Tested positive, so among those who said, I have been tested, we also asked another question. Was the test positive, eh? or did you get a positive test, uh, a medical test? And actually, the more people believe conspiracy theories, the more likely they were to actually have tested positive. Now, did you receive a fine for uh, violating corona violations? You see here that the confidence interval is huge. That's because we actually only had three participants in our entire sample that uh, had received the fine. So this. This finding is actually meaningless. We don't have any news about that. But we also asked, so did you receive too many visitors in your home then was allowed at the time? Did you visit a party or bar where it was more crowded than it was allowed at the time? And also the more people had believed conspiracy theories, the more likely they were to say yes to that. Uh, these were interesting. Have you lost your job? So uh, that we actually also find that the more people believe conspiracy theories, uh, the more likely they were to have lost their job. And uh, that was picked up a bit uh, rigidly in the media, so it was a, a newspaper that it posted uh, if people, something, I don't know the exact headline, but uh, something like believing conspiracy theories may get you fired. No, we didn't conclude that. That's of course, we don't know about the causality. It's also very well possible that people who have insecure jobs are more likely to believe conspiracy theories. But then again, then it's of course interesting to also see that eight months later, they indeed have lost uh, that job. So in the Actual article, we are a bit new, more nuanced about it than the uh, newspaper article. Also more reduced in, in income. And then these two were actually also quite interesting, I think. So this was, this was um, have you been uh, uh, rejected by other people for your opinion about Corona? And this one was, have you rejected others for their opinion about Corona? And here we actually see that um, people who are high on conspiracy beliefs, are more likely to have experienced rejection and less likely to have uh, uh, rejected others. So I think this suggests 
and that in Dutch society, people have become quite intolerant of conspiracy believers, actually. So people don't really, uh, um, people who are low on conspiracy beliefs are more likely to uh, terminate social contact with conspiracy believers rather than and vice versa. So there's a, yeah, apparently also clearly a social cost to it. Now, um, there's also a lot of other research uh, on, for instance, um, you know, adhering to the corona measures. Uh, we measured several of them, but for simplicity, I, uh, simplicity, I'll, I'll focus here on physical distancing. Yeah? So to what extent do you physical, uh, physically distance? And um, this is well known. There's many research uh, uh, studies have shown this uh, in the past two years, that the more people believe conspiracy theories, the less likely they are to follow the corona rules, the less likely they are to uh, physically distance, for instance. But how, how to explain that? What, what, uh, what, what, what is, for instance, the causal order uh, here? And I think, uh, yeah, in terms of conspiracy theories over time, there are two possible perspectives. And the first one is the idea that conspiracy theories are influential. So if we think that the regulations by the health authorities shouldn't be trusted, then uh, as a result of that, we, shouldn't, we, we don't feel compelled to follow them. And therefore, uh, as time progresses, uh, the less likely we are to, uh, to uh, follow these guidelines. And if this is true, the conspiracy theories pro predicts the progressive decrease in physical distancing over time. But there's actually also another idea, and this was, I read that first in this book, uh, by Hugo Mercier, but then I also, after that, saw it in at various other places. And I thought this was actually really clever uh, and really interesting, which is that uh, maybe the order is reverse. Conspiracy theories can also be a justification mechanism. So if you really don't like these uh, these measures, uh, and, and you know there's a strong norm, strong social pressure to follow them, but you really don't, don't like them, and then uh, conspiracy theories and a conspiratorial narrative can help you justify them. Why should I socially physically distance? These authorities that tell us to do that are lying all the time. And therefore, if this is true, then you predict that the priest physical distancing predicts increased conspiracy thinking over time. Now, the nice thing with this design, of course, with these three measurement points is that they allow for a test uh, of these uh, two perspectives. Now, let's uh, walk you through it. And this, I'm gonna walk you through it uh, step by step, actually. So this may look a little bit overwhelming, but uh, bear with me a little bit. First, a little, what, what do all the numbers mean? There's, um, uh, we have a cross leg panel model and a random intercept cross leg panel model. So these numbers over here on the left are the results for the cross leg panel model. These are the overall relationships between these variables. And the one in italics on the right, that's, that's the so-called random intercept cross leg panel model. That's an indicator of within person change over time. So um, there's between a within person effect. So uh, conspiracy people high on conspiracy beliefs differ from people low in conspiracy beliefs. And that also will, you know, uh, they, they, they will therefore also behave differently over time. But this letter coefficient actually indicates how much does an at the individual level people change, behave differently as time progresses. So that's, that's uh, the indicator. Now, le now let me walk you through it. So first thing, and um, we didn't really predict this, but I thought it was interesting nevertheless, is just the associations between conspiracy beliefs and physical distancing. I noted, you know, the more people believe in conspiracy theories, the less they physically distance. And we actually find that, but we actually only find that at wave one and wave three, and not at wave two. So this actually only happens when there's a lockdown and not when, not when everything had reopened. I thought that was actually quite uh, interesting and suggests that these relationships are sensitive to uh, the societal context. Now, then let's also look at these uh, overall cross legged effects. Um, now you see actually that uh, there's some evidence, there's evidence actually from both perspectives. So uh, if conspiracy beliefs to physical distancing, higher conspiracy beliefs predict lower physical distancing on both occasions, and lower physical distancing predicts more conspiracy beliefs. But these are standardized coefficients. So that means that the higher the number, actually, the stronger the effect. Okay, so you can actually see that the effects from conspiracy beliefs to physical distancing are, uh, well, a lot stronger than, uh, than, 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 than vice versa. So here we find some support for both perspectives, but more strongly for the idea that conspiracy theories uh, are influential. And then let, let's look at within person change. There we actually only find one relevant significant effect, and that's this one. So apparently conspiracy beliefs uh, uh, predict a decrease at the individual level uh, of people's willingness to physical distance, distance but only early in the pandemic. Not, not later on, only from wave one to wave two. 
So let me summarize these results. So for physical distancing, more support for the notion that conspiracy theories are influential. Um, these overall cross leg effects point in both directions, but the effects of conspiracy beliefs predicting physical distancing over time are much stronger than vice versa. And if you look at within person change, only conspiracy beliefs predict a decrease in physical distancing over time and not vice versa, but only early in the pandemic. Apparently, later in the pandemic, the extent to which people are willing to physically distance has stabilized or at least no longer dependent on, on, on the conspiracy views that they uh, uh, have. Now, should we now conclude that this is, you know, a bit of a marginal uh, theory that conspiracy views are influential? Actually, <laughs> no, physically dis physical distancing is only one variable. And it's, uh, of course, one that's not very effortful. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's not, uh, well, okay, it has, of course, sizable implications for people who own a shop or a restaurant or that sort of thing. But, but, but in their everyday life, for many people, it's not something that's, you know, has many implications. What about something that many people find a bit more scary and intrusive, like getting vaccinated? Uh, this is a new study, uh, more recently, and that we carried out in 2021. Uh, we did this among United States participants. This is not nationally representative or anything, but still, I thought it was interesting. The results were very interesting, and they also surprised me a bit. Um, it's well known that higher conspiracy theories are associated with lower vaccination intentions. But again, you can ask the same question. What, what's the directionality of the effects? And this was actually, and this genuinely surprised me, actually. Uh, I have to admit that. Uh, that conspiracy theories at time one uh, did not predict a decrease in uh, vaccination intention at time two. But decreased vaccination intention at time one did predict increased COVID conspiracy theories at time two. So apparently for vaccination intention, apparently there is this justification process going on. Apparently, uh, yeah, I don't know, people just don't want the vaccine, they find it scary, maybe they're afraid of needles, I don't know, or, or they just don't trust the vaccine. And then conspiracy theories provide them with a reason why they shouldn't get vaccinated, right? So they, uh, that's, that, that, that's the idea. So are they harmful during the pandemic? So uh, let's close on the first research question. Um, so during the pandemic, conspiracy predicts uh, detrimental behavioral and life outcomes uh, over time. So we have seen that uh, eight months later, uh, it influenced whether or not, it, it predicted whether or not people got tested or whether the test was positive, uh, whether or not uh, people violated rules, economic outcomes such as job loss, social rejection. So uh, that suggests a yes. Oh, sorry. And the temporal order and, and psychological me mechanism uh, appears to vary a bit per uh, dependent measure. So there are these two, there's these two perspectives. So the conspiracy beliefs are influential and, and it's a justification mechanism. And appear, there appears to be a grain of truth in, in both of these perspectives. Uh, for physical distancing, that, uh, yeah, that's, there's just more stronger, stronger efforts support for the notion that the conspiracy beliefs are influential. Vaccine hesitancy. Um, there's actually more evidence that it's uh, a method to justify people's anti-vaccination sentiments. One disclaimer for the finding on vaccine hesitancy, I also have another three-wave study in the Netherlands, and I haven't gotten the time to analyze it yet, so, so there's more data uh, coming up. Now, then I would like to move to the second part of my uh, talk. So why uh, do conspiracy theories uh, flourish during a pandemic? What is it about conspiracy beliefs that make them so uh, appealing? Now, um, it is actually well known in this field that societal crisis situations, uh, that conspiracy beliefs particularly gain traction in, in societal crisis situations. Also, historians have noted that actually, um, and psychologists have done extensive research showing that feelings of anxiety and uncontrollability and uncertainty um, yeah, stimulate conspiracy uh, beliefs. And yeah, there, there's quite a few psychological reasons for that. The idea is that when people feel anxious, they, they want to explain and, and explain their environment and they are on guard of possible threats. And then they tend to yeah, uh, overestimate the hostile intentions of others. It's partly also a self-defensive uh, mechanism, actually. actually. And yeah, the stress can be in society, uh, be, uh, yeah, experienced through various means. There's now a pandemic, but there may also like an economic crisis, a uh, conspiracy, uh, yeah, wars or terrorist strikes can be 
uh, yeah, uh, can stimulate lots of conspiracy beliefs. When this is actually a picture of the Notre Dame fire, when uh, the Notre Dame was on fire, it took about an hour uh, before all sorts of conspiracy theories about who started the fire started spreading on social media. That went really fast at the time. So this suggests that this is, uh, societal experience events that, that, that we find distressing that we you know that surprise us and that we find, uh, don't, don't see as particularly positive uh, cause conspiracy theories. but why again and uh, i would like to uh, make an argument that this is um, caused by actually three complementary processes that the stress changes our brain uh, processes information it also changes how we perceive the social world, and it also changes uh, our, the polarization of our uh, political and religious and ideological beliefs. Now, we know from a lot of previous research that uh, anxiety, for instance, influences uh, yeah, uh, how the brain perceives patterns in the world and agency, but for that only we'll get to that, but um, that's when people are anxious, they also start, you know, thinking more in terms of us versus them, that prejudice then goes up, for instance, and that uh, yeah, people radicalize more uh, when they're, uh, when they're uh, just, uh, worried about the future. So what I'll, I'm gonna do is actually mostly illuminating how these three uh, factors are related with conspiracy thinking uh, in, uh, in, in, in research. Uh, professor. Uh, yes. Do we also get at the end the chance to do a sort of Q and A or? Yes, yes, actually, uh, I'm, I'm first going to uh, do a talk and then there's going to be a short break and then a Q&A. But if you have a pressing question, you are already free to ask it, actually. No, I, I cannot ask you right now because they're very uh, substantial and they may distract you from your uh, presentation. So I would leave it for the end. Can we do it at the end? Very good. Now, pattern perception. What is pattern perception? Every human being perceives patterns. That's what our brain does. Um, it's uh, looking at relations between stimuli in the world, uh, looking at cause and effect relationships. And this is very functional. Why? Because there are actually a lot of existing patterns in the world. If there's a red traffic light, you need to stop because if you drive through it, you may get an accident. That's a real and existing pattern. But inherent to conspiracy beliefs is that people tend to see a lot of patterns that may not necessarily be there. Think of the QAnon movements who, uh, who was, uh, well, during the Trump presidency saw all sorts of logic in what happened in Trump's speeches and thought they were seeing all sorts of clues in uh, Trump's rhetoric suggesting that he was fighting uh, a secret war against a, a dem democratic deep state. Now, let's have a look at, uh, at the research. So uh, we call this in psychology, um, there's pattern perception, so many patterns are real, but there's also illusory pattern perception and illusory pattern perception means seeing patterns in stimuli that are actually random. So illusory pattern perception is, for instance, very high in, um, in, in, in people with a, a gambling addiction, people who are regularly uh, yeah, go to uh, casinos. I mean, at the roulette table, they see all sorts of, of patterns that may not be there. Now, we, um, in, in the first, so what, what did we do? So uh, that, that, that is the definition of pattern perception, perceiving patterns in random or chaotic stimuli. And then in the first study, uh, we had uh, um, a computer algorithm uh, throw a digital coin a hundred times. So this was completely random. And we divided, uh, the, the, this in we cut this up in, in chunks of 10. So uh, here, uh, this is what it looked like, head stills, and so forth. So it was truly random. And then we asked participants, uh, you know, so what do you see here? These, uh, these, these coin toss outcomes, was this uh, uh, completely random? Or was this uh, was this string of uh, point of outcomes uh, generated through a non-random process? Now the funny thing is, uh, it, when it comes to randomness, that the human brain is very bad at detecting randomness. Actually, uh, uh, if you ask humans to create a fully random string of point of outcomes, but they're not allowed to use a coin, they can't do it. And why? Because humans alternate too much. They you know do heads, heads, and then the third one. They feel, yeah, no, it now needs to be tails because otherwise it's not random. Ah, <laughs> that's where it's not random anymore. True randomness doesn't care whether or not the third, whether or not you get four or five or six times uh, heads in a row. And therefore, there's more clusters than uh, in actual random sequences than our brain would uh, assume. So uh, our brain, uh, you know, sees clusters and thinks that's not random, but that's what actual randomness tends to look like. 
Now, uh, what did we do? We asked them whether or not they thought these patterns were, if these, that there were patterns or whether it was random. And then we asked them for a range of common conspiracy theories like the 9 11 uh, strikes, whether it was an inside job, like the moon landings. Uh, this was in 2018, so we couldn't ask for Corona yet, but we did have a question about Ebola. Uh, so, well, uh, okay, okay, I don't like that. And we actually found this was pretty um, uh, well uh, correlated with one another. So, the more people saw patterns in random point outcomes, the more likely they were to believe conspiracy theories. Also, in a, in a different study, we uh, showed them these paintings. They're from uh, Jackson Pollock. Uh, now, I'm not going to say they're completely uh, yeah, uh, random. But at least they're very chaotic. Uh, in our data, we uh, saw that the participants rated them that it was chaotic. People differ immensely what they see in here. Some people just see paint splashed on canvas. Other people see all sorts of nice geometric outcomes. And we also asked them, you know, what, what do you see? Or do you see patterns? Or do you see uh, yeah, uh, pretty much nothing? And the more strongly people saw patterns, the more likely they were to be conspiracy. Uh, on a funny note, uh, we also asked them how beautiful they thought the painting was. This was just, you know, to make participants give the impression that this was a study about art. And uh, but the correlation between how beautiful is this painting and uh, do you see patterns was above 0.60. So this is really high in the social sciences. So what determines if people find a painting like this beautiful? It's it's the question whether or not they see patterns in it uh, or, or not. So that was well, I thought that was interesting, but completely unrelated to conspiracy theories, of course. Um, also, uh, this is another study, so believes that spurious uh, uh, relations represent an actual relation that's also uh, related to conspiracy uh, thinking. So an example of what uh, Reine van der Waal did is uh, uh, she um, had, for instance, an example of uh, well, the, the amount of chocolate that's being consumed in a country is correlated with the number of Nobel Prize winners in that country. Completely spurious relationship, of course, but the more strongly people believe conspiracy theories, the more likely they were to believe that this was an actual causal effect. Okay, so apparently eating chocolate makes you very, very smart. So well, <laughs> we know what to do. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, another mental process, uh, I think it's very relevant here, agency detection. Um, conspiracy theories almost by, yeah, by definition, I would say, uh, uh, is about um, uh, conspirators behind the scene who have an intention, right? Who do, who do things on purpose. And you see that in all other sorts uh, of evidentiary, non evidentiary beliefs, like, like believing ghosts, for instance. That's also, uh, yeah, your brain seeing agency where it may not necessarily be there. Uh, sometimes people also ascribe agency to the weather, huh? like uh, as if the weather has a purpose. Uh, why is it raining on my holiday? Is it to punish me? Uh, no, you're, it's just bad luck. So, uh, agency detection and there's quite a few studies also showing that agency detection is associated with conspiracy uh, thinking now the second uh, building block so uh, yeah how the brain processes information is associated with conspiracy thinking oh, and i should have mentioned so the feelings of anxiety that, that, that that's a lot of other research has shown that also increases pattern perception and, and agency detection when our brain when we get anxious our brain starts to see more patterns and see more agency than when we're not scared um, Intergroup conflict, and when people are anxious, uh, conflict also uh, increases. Um, you will actually, uh, in, intergroup conflict is also a good predictor of conspiracy beliefs. You can see that, for instance, in the United States, where uh, Republicans and Democrats have conspiracy beliefs about each other. Um, there's typical Republican and, and Democratic conspiracy beliefs, like birther and truther, yeah. Obama's birth certificates. Uh, that's a typical Republican conspiracy theory. But for those who think that only Republicans believe conspiracy theory, the belief that the 9-11 uh, terrorist strikes were an inside job is actually stronger among Democrats. And why? Uh, well, that actually makes sense. There was, after all, a Republican uh, administration in the White House when it happened. And Kuczynski and Barrett, actually two scientists from Miami, have noted that conspiracy theories are for losers. I'm not sure how much hate mail they got over that, but what they actually meant was conspiracy theories are for election losers. So when in 2016, Trump won the election, then you saw conspiracy theories that the elections were rigged going up uh, among Democrats and down among Republicans. And uh, yeah, well, in the 2020 election, I, I don't think we need to get into that. We've all seen what happened at uh, Capitol, uh, Capitol Hill. 
Um, we also see that during the current pandemic, uh, Trump has explicitly, has explicitly uh, called the COVID, uh, the coronavirus, uh, a Chinese virus and expressed his support for the theory that it was made in a Chinese lab. Um, was this feeling mutual, mutual? Actually, some high ranked Chinese diplomats uh, actually expressed the theory it might be the US military that has brought the coronavirus to Wuhan. There's actually also a lot of conspiracy theories in China about the United States. Now, we actually did a study on uh, intergroup conflict in the uh, context between, of China versus the United States. And uh, this study took place before the pandemic, I should note. This was actually more about the, uh, in the context of the China-US trade war that was going on during uh, Trump's presidency. And I got um, a research master student from China. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, we could, yeah, she, she spoke Chinese and we could uh, do uh, part of the study in China. So we, uh, yeah, she was very excited about it. So we seized on the opportunity. Um, so we had 254 United States participants and 228 Chinese partic uh, uh, participants. I'm going to try to briefly get rid of this in order to make it readable. So it, it took place in the spring of 2019. An example of questions that we asked was the secret agency of China has been trying to influence political decision making in America. That's why we asked the United States participants. The Chinese sample we asked this. Um, it, for those who are unable to speak Chinese, I'm willing to translate it. It means the secret agency of America has been trying to influence political decision making. In China. Now let's see uh, what you predict. Where do you think these conspiracy theories are going to be high? Who of you thinks that conspiracy, these conspiracy beliefs will be higher in the United States? Yeah. Okay. And who thinks they are going to be higher in China? Okay. okay. I think the majority thinks the United States and the minority thinks China. I belonged to the majority, that was my prediction, but my Chinese PhD uh, student, she instantly said, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It's way higher in China. And, uh, and she was right. It, it really was a lot higher in China, actually, and that was uh, pretty interesting. But um, more interesting is why that's the case. Um, China and, and the United States are different cultures, and two cultural uh, dimensions that uh, drive uh, that, that, that differ between these countries are uh, the acceptance of hierarchy in society and uh, and, uh, and vertical collectivism. So um, yeah, they're both both cultural dimensions. That means that you uh, need to prioritize the group goals and accept group authorities above your own goals. So in other words, the group is simply more important uh, in China than in the United States, which is a relatively individualistic culture. And if that's the case, then you're also going to be more concerned about uh, another group that's threatening you, like starting a trade war. And we saw that. We saw that higher levels of yeah, collective narcissism, that's an extreme form of ego favoritism, which is part of, of, of group conflict and also a strong belief that the, uh, the other group poses a threat to the country. Now, uh, that these are the two key elements of, of conflict, that, uh, that, that, that your cohesion in your own group goes up and that you perceive the other group as a threat. And we also clearly saw that uh, in the data. So apparently, uh, yeah, Chinese people, due to, our, due to the, these, these cultural variables, are more, were more likely to, uh, to experience the situation as, as threatening and to see uh, the United States as the enemy. And that drove conspiracy beliefs. We also did uh, another study on vaccine hesitancy a little bit more recently. Uh, so uh, this was a study. Uh, this study was done in the uh, United States. Uh, uh, it was in the context of the COVID vaccines and we asked our participants, so okay, imagine there's this uh, new COVID vaccine and it's very safe. It's, uh, it's uh, effective 95% uh, times it has been, uh, you know, uh, approved by medical institu institutions. And we told them it was a vaccine uh, uh, created by Chinese scientists or by United States scientists. And we found that United States participants were far more likely to uh, take the vaccine if they read it was made by United States scientists than if it was made by Chinese scientists. And they were also less likely to believe conspiracy theories about the vaccine. Now, then when I saw this data, I uh, asked my other Chinese PhD students, I am going to tra translate it in Chinese, and we ran the same materials in China, and then we found this. So uh, actually Chinese 
participants were actually far more likely to want the Chinese vaccine and, uh, and not the United States vaccine. And the conspiracy beliefs were actually uh, much lower when uh, it was uh, a vaccine uh, made in China than in the United States. So here you again see that these intergroup distinctions uh, and, and, and yeah, groups that are have a comfortable, uncomfortable relation with one another drives conspiracy beliefs and in this case also uh, vaccination uh, intentions. Um, on a side note, I didn't know that, but, but, but Ian Wong pointed that out to me and I checked it and it was actually correct for a large part of 2021. If you wanted to go to China, okay, then it wasn't enough to just be vaccinated. Now you needed to have been vaccinated with a Chinese vaccine. So if you had Pfizer or Moderna, you were not getting in the country. You needed another shot of Sinovac. I thought that was interesting. Um, now then the third pillar uh, of, of, of my argument is uh, polarized opinions. Um, so we know also from research that when people, uh, when people are pessimistic about the future, for instance, or when they're uh, about society, then these radical beliefs tend to grow up, such as populism, but also extremism. Um, populist movements have been uh, widely uh, associated with uh, conspiracy beliefs, uh, in for instance, Brexit uh, movements uh, at the time when Brexit took place. Um, one of the best predictors of a vote uh, in favor of the Brexit were conspiracy, uh, anti uh, 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 sort of Islamophobic conspiracy beliefs. So, uh, these conspiracy beliefs suggesting that there was this uh, Muslim conspiracy in the EU uh, trying to uh, you know, uh, Islamize Europe. That was a really good predictor of Brexit vote. Of course, in the United States, with Donald Trump, who managed to get President, not I, I seriously think not, not despite his conspiracy beliefs, but because of his conspiracy beliefs, he gave a voice to many uh, yeah, people who uh, had similar sentiments. Um, this was a study that we recently published about populism and, uh, and, and conspiracy beliefs. Um, when you hear the rhetoric of populist citizens or populist leaders, and you quickly get the impression that these are. Uh, critical citizens, or at least see themselves as critical citizens, but yeah, why then uh, believe all these conspiracy theories? This was actually a study that um, suggested that uh, populist attitudes aren't just associated with conspiracy beliefs, but uh, with uh, belief in a lot of other non-evidentiary beliefs. We found that people, who, uh, the more people are populists, higher on populist attitudes, the more likely they believe conspiracy theories. The more likely they believe news items that were politically neutral, regardless of whether it was broadcast by a mainstream source or an alternative new, new source. Um, bullshit receptivity, you may say, hey, what is that? Uh, a social scientist that uses the word bullshit. This is actually a scale uh, uh, that measures the extent to which people, uh, so people are given complete nonsense statements and then participants are asked to what, what extent they see some sort of deeper meaning in them. And uh, the higher people score in populist attitudes, the more likely they are to see uh, yeah, a deeper meaning in also statements. And we also found them more likely to believe in the paranormal. And this was actually mediated not by analytic thinking or anything. So they were actually, uh, it wasn't because of differences in analytic thinking. We actually found uh, people who were populist uh, attitudes were about as smart as people who were low on populist attitudes. It wasn't that. Uh, it was a greater trust in their hunches, a greater tendency to rely on their first impression, to, to rely on their intuition. That was what actually uh, was driving this. Um, here are some older findings of us looking at political polarization. Um, so conspiracy uh, uh, theories are more prevalent, prevalent among both the left and right extremes of the political spectrum. Um, this was where two these were findings large, mostly in, in the Netherlands. We also have one study in the United States, but uh, yeah, so particularly the left and the right extreme belief conspiracy theories more. This was also due to um, an increased belief in simple structures. So the belief that there are simple solutions to complex problems that's also a more stronger at the extremes. Now this was a finding that yeah, got a lot of heat actually by other scientists because a lot of other scientists found uh, that it was actually stronger at uh, the political right than at the left. So one well, colleague of mine from uh, Germany and then at some point approached me like, how about we set up a huge international study testing this relationship in as many countries as we can. And we, uh, yeah, we uh, used our network a little bit to try to uh, you know, get many collaborators for that. And eventually, and this just got published in Nature Human Behavior. So we looked at the quadratic term in 26 nations in more than 100 participants. 
And by and large, so these are two studies, actually, these were uh, the, the overall quadratic term. You actually find that it differs a little bit across countries. So there's uh, some difference across country. But by and large, you do find good evidence for this, uh, uh, for this U shape. Um, does that go against the idea that it's more prominent at the right? Actually, no. We also found support for that. Uh, in most cases, it's not, it's not a symmetric U shape. It was more like, like uh, an editor called it a Nike swoosh, <laughs> so that, so that the, 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 the lowest conspiracy beliefs were slightly left of center and then uh, went higher when people became more extremely left wing. And then um, we also found that we also distinguished between right wing attitudes about economic and uh, social, is social and cultural issues. Um, we found no relationship between being economically right-wing, so that's free market thinking, but a very strong relationship between social and being socially and culturally right-wing, so that's this anti-immigration thinking. If people score high on that, that's a really good predictor of conspiracy beliefs, actually. Um, actually, there's also, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a quantitative researcher, but uh, there's also a lot of qualitative research being done. And this is uh, one that I find very interesting. I didn't conduct that uh, study, unfortunately, because I think it's really cool, um, uh, a cool study. And uh, this was uh, uh, two researchers who uh, analyzed uh, for uh, over 50 extremist groups, uh, underground extremist groups. Uh, so our, our previous data were still regular citizens who voted and fill out questionnaire, but these were groups such as uh, Armee Fraction, neo-Nazis, uh, Al-Qaeda, and analyzed their speeches uh, their documentation and, and checked uh, whether or not they could find conspiracy theories. There were a lot of different groups, different ideologies, some of them not e easy to classify. Uh, so there were also anti-technology uh, groups in there. Um, well, that, that, that can also be a way to radicalize. And uh, yeah, what I actually found was really interesting was that although many of these groups wanted completely different things, there was one thing that really bound, bind, uh, bound them and that is in most of them, not all, but the vast majority of them, uh, you know, their documentation and their speeches, there were just lots of conspiracy theories in there. In there. And there were actually also a couple of common themes, like the belief in an, um, a one big uh, secret world government was, for instance, a theme that, that you know, appeared pretty much in left, right and religious fundamentalist uh, groups. Uh, so, yeah, there were, of course, also differences with left wing groups being more about the multinationals and well, okay, I think you can fill in those uh, those things yourself. So why do conspiracy beliefs flourish? Um, so um, we know from previous research that basic mental that, that anxiety influences basic mental operations, and these basic mental operations, namely better perception and agency protection, uh, are associated with increased conspiracy beliefs. Sorry. Uh, Social perception, a tendency to see the world in us versus them when people are anxious, uh, people, our mind starts making these sharp group distinctions. And that also, we've seen that in this uh, US versus China studies, that it's also associated with conspiracy beliefs. And polarized opinions. So radical beliefs are also heavily uh, intertwined with conspiracy thinking. And having said that, I am uh, at the end of my talk. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I want to thank you all for your attention. Also, thanks to the people at home. And uh, well, I'm open to any questions you might have. Okay, hey, um, just for the people at home, um, if you wanna ask a question, you can ask a question either by just uh, writing your question in the, uh, the chat box and uh, we can have someone here uh, read it out um, or feel free to put up your digital hand and um, uh, speak your question uh, if you prefer that way instead. Uh, Do we need a short break or shall we do <clears throat> that straight away? Oh, I didn't think we're good. Yeah, Let's go okay. okay. Up to you. I'm fine. I'll switch off the recording then. Yeah.